What's an industry secret in the field you work in? Auto insurance agent. Please, for the love of God, don't tell auto insurance agents more than you have to. They ask you a question? Just say yes or no and answer the question as straight as you can. If you go on and on about your life story, you will probably end up saying something you don't have to, and thus making your rate go higher, or getting yourself declined. We want to get you that policy as cheap as possible. Only tell us what we need to know and don't say anything else. We now have a Discord. Check out the server in the link in the description. Story 2. I'm a dentist. Here's the lowdown on toothpaste. As long as it has fluoride, they're basically all the same. When I was in dental school, the Colgate lady came by and said that everything that says Colgate total on it is all exactly the same. The only difference is the packaging. So whether it says whitening or gum protection or whatever else, it's all the same. The exception is sensitivity toothpaste. It typically does have an extra active ingredient, KNO3, which helps with sensitivity. Don't ever feel obligated to buy the expensive toothpaste because you think it will be better for your teeth. Just buy whatever you like best. I don't know what KNO3 is. Is that like, uh, ooh, my periodic table is rusty. Uh, potassium nitrous oxide? Or oxid something because there's three of them? I don't know. That's my best guess. Story 3. Library worker here. The majority of donations we receive do not end up in circulation, on our shelves. No matter how much you demand we put them there once they're donated. The reason why this is is because we only add items to the collection that we think will circulate, be checked out. Most libraries get funding based off statistics. We don't want to waste shelf space on items that people aren't checking out, as it won't improve our stats. So, unless the donated items are brand new or by popular authors, we will not add them to the collection. We will also weed on popular items from our collection with extreme prejudice for this reason, much to our patrons' horror. These books usually end up being sold at book sales to help generate funding for other library programs. Story 4. A lot of librarians will waive your fines if you have an excuse and you don't ask too frequently. Even large ones. Also, librarians don't care about your fines and we aren't judging you. Please come back. We personally have more fines than you. Librarians are always overdue with their books. Story 5. A huge portion of online reviews, ratings, social media presence, etc. that you see for any given company are fake, paid for, or done by multiple accounts controlled by us. This includes a company's glass door page. Fake reviews about how great it is to work there, so that the million negative reviews don't crush their page. I'm not saying it's every company out there, but it's been a lot of the ones I've worked for. Source. Am a copywriter. What are ethics? I surely don't know anymore. Story 6. I work in logistics for a massive manufacturing company. Money's not real. A thousand dollars for eight light bulbs. Story 7. I was working for a large specialized manufacturer where virtually every order for parts or service would be in tens of thousands of dollars with the average order closer to a million. A customer needed to purchase four steel bolts, just normal steel bolts. Person following internal guidelines tacked on all this overhead. Bolts came to several thousand dollars. The employee had no idea what bolts cost and assumed the guidelines were right. The customer, not being an idiot, kept pushing back. This went on for several months. Eventually, it got escalated high up in our company to someone who had the authority to approve $1 billion in spending, who was being asked to intervene on four bolts. I am a native speaker, and the company was not a native English-speaking one. So this eventually fell to me, as I got forwarded months of correspondence. It went something like this. Here's the estimate for the four bolts. Here's a link to four bolts of the same size for $20 with shipping. Our bolts are $10,000. Yes, but why are they $10,000? We need to purchase from you to maintain our warranty, but we cannot understand the price difference. Here is a technical sheet for the bolt. Yes, I agree. They are bolts. This does not explain why they are $10,000. Thousand dollars. Here's a technical document from R&D describing the features of the bolt. Yes, we know how bolts work. This does not explain why they are ten thousand dollars. I have negotiated with my manager. We are willing to sell you the bolts for eight thousand dollars. Again, these are four bolts. They should not cost anywhere near that much. We have given you a two thousand dollar discount and are no longer making profit. I cannot offer you a larger discount. These are four bolts that cannot cost you more than a few dollars to make. How can you not be making profit on this? Your company has wasted more time and cost on this correspondence than it would have cost to just send the four bolts in an envelope. Bolt cost? Less than one dollar for all four of them. I sent them for free and had to justify the $8,000 loss to management. 
Thankfully, the management was not quite as dumb as the employee wasting three months of their time on back and forth about a bolt. I seriously wonder how much time was wasted creating documentation to justify the price of this bolt. There was a department-wide email afterwards explaining how bolts work and that they should not cost as much. No change to the overhead policy for small orders, though. Who is this employee to think that the bolts could possibly cost $8,000 to make? That just seems absurd to me. How did this person enter the workforce? Because that is a new level of just not understanding anything. Story 8. Former aircraft fueler. Don't check your pets in kennels. Especially in summer or winter. They are submitted to some very harsh environments. They're left on belt loaders in the sweltering heat right next to a running APU that's loud enough to deafen human ears. Let alone a dog's. It's terrible. I always feel so sorry for them. American Airlines will destroy your luggage. They get overloaded on carts, fall off on the way to the plane, and are left there to get run over by tankers and, yes, fuelers, and rained on, then dragged to the edge of the ramp to sit all night while you arrive at your destination and wonder where the hell your bags are. If your departure is delayed, 90% of the time, it's us, the fueler. Look out the window to the right side if it's a small plane, left side if it's a really big one. If there's a truck sitting under the wing, we're the reason you're late. Sorry. Story 9. Healthcare. Homemaker. If your grandparent or parent gets in-home care, please know that your family member could live in a cockroach-infested house and not have to move if they didn't want to. It's not up to the company to give your loved ones environmentally safe places to live. It's up to the family. They can certainly try to persuade, but they can't force. Why do I know this? Because I've been to the cockroach-infested house where an 80-year-old woman lives. I have a mentally ill client that put bleach in his dog's water to help with its breath. I have a client who never cleans his cat box. I have a client who has a caved-in ceiling. I've called it in, but there's no help from the company. All they say is, there's nothing we can do, it's up to the family members. It's a sad, sad thing, because there are so many family members and friends who really just don't give a crap how some people are living. Sure, they'll visit, but do they clean the litter box? Do they make sure there are no cockroaches? Do they make sure the house is stable and not falling apart? Nope. They say they care and that they love the person, but they don't care enough to make sure they live in a healthy environment. It really worries me, because if I imagine my own mother having such a deteriorated mind and there is no other family member to help her, she could live in a run-down, cockroach-infested house, if she was stubborn enough. It frustrates me, because whereas the client does have rights, should they really have the right to live somewhere where their health could be at risk? Where their caregivers could be at risk as well? Story 10. Amusement park ride operator here. If your kid is crying and you want us to stop the ride, even if we want to, it's not going to stop immediately. The carousel will spin a few more circles or the ship will swing a few more times before stopping. The only exception is the emergency stop, which will absolutely screw up the ride for a while if we press it. Therefore, we only use it in really life-threatening scenarios. The best thing you can try to do is just get your kid to calm down as the ride comes to a stop. And no, yelling, STOP THE RIDE! at us does not make it stop any faster. Story 11. Change your dirty furnace filters and clean your AC coils outside. These make up an easy 30% of my calls for no heat or cooling. Edit. More attention than I thought. So, real quick, you have two coils, inside and outside. Your furnace filter keeps the inside one clean, so make sure that filter is clean. Usually 5 16th or 1 quarter nut driver and like 20 screws. Don't use high pressure water, simply on a shower setting and hold it a few inches away from the coil. Do it from both ways. Button that beauty up and wait for it to dry before turning power back on. Your head pressures are going to love you. Oh, and don't forget to blow your condensate line more than your husband. Prevents water flowing back into the unit from a block. Story 12. Cigarettes were years ago demanded by the EU to contain less nicotine. The manufacturers of cigarettes looked at each other quite dumbfounded because how are you supposed to extract a naturally occurring product in a plant? The solution was ingenious, and the EU demand eventually helped the tobacco industry skyrocket in income. The tobacco is, during production, treated with liquid nitrogen, which almost doubles the volume of the tobacco, making significantly less tobacco needed to fill a cigarette, thereby lowering the amount of nicotine. Story 13. I work at a university. I'm not an academic advisor in any department, but I provide services to them and help them graduate people when it's unclear whether students met all the requirements or not. And the industry secret is that most of you really don't know what you want to do when you start college. The half that say they do are mainly programmed by their parents. Go into IT, make large dollars. But they have no idea of what they'd really like. So don't feel weird or a failure if you change majors. It means that you actually looked around and found something you like better. Stats show that students who change majors do better, edit, on average, in school than the ones who stick with the major they came in on. This shouldn't actually be a secret, but students don't seem to know it. 
graduating high school, that was like super burned into me. That yeah, most people change their majors, so don't stress about what you go in with, for one, and two, don't stress if you feel like you want to change. On the downside, yes, it does cost a whole year of tuition. But like, still, it's better than spending three more on something you don't like. In fact, I changed my major after my first year too, so yeah, OP's right. Story 14. Audio engineer here, a few seemingly obvious things to point out. 9 out of 10 times with a studio, you get what you pay for. You have to pay for years of experience, acclaimed expertise, plus hundreds of thousands of dollars in equipment and software. Not to mention the hundreds of thousands of dollars that went into the acoustic engineering of the physical recording space alone. People walk into great studios, balk at the $1,000 a song, but don't realize they're getting access to close to a million dollars in tools. Plus, an engineer who's going to make them sound better than life. On the flip side of that coin, be wary of eye candy. Don't be fooled by big mixing consoles. Sometimes, they're not even used for your music, hell, sometimes they don't even function. I've seen studios where the sole purpose of a large board is to dupe unsuspecting musicians into parting with their money. In larger studios, bands with smaller budgets are often stuck with an intern, who may not even be getting paid. If your music is crap, no amount of production is going to make it a hit. As a small studio owner, I only share work that I think will bring me more business. Wondering why I haven't shared your music? It's because it's garbage. Billie Eilish recorded on budget equipment at home with her brother. Those recordings were then worked on by some of the best engineers in the world to make it sound like it wasn't. Be wary of a record label. They may offer to front the costs of your recording and touring, but you have no creative control over your sound, as well as where you record, your tour schedule, and usually the label will own your music. Oh, and you have to pay back all of that money to the label. Be cautious of studios that claim so-and-so recorded here. There's a studio in Iowa that claims Slipknot recorded here, and while it's true, Slipknot did record in that building, it was a different owner, different engineers, and some different equipment. You're not going to sound like Slipknot there. Sorry. Story 15. Worked at a department store photography studio owned by a major photography company that you can imagine probably took your school yearbook photos. The company also is partnered with a popular online photo order website. Notice how quickly we write down a price, strike it out, and then write a new price as the deal? Yeah, that's pretty much just the price that everyone gets. We aren't doing the math that fast. We have it memorized, because almost everyone that comes in has that 40% off coupon. Don't come in without a coupon. There is always a coupon on the website. If you end up paying for sitting fees, it's because you just didn't go on the website. Honestly, don't buy our photos. If you just do the session and say that you'll buy them online later on said partnered photo order site, it'll be cheaper than if you buy them in store that day. Yes, even when we say, oh, but you won't get this deal online. If you do buy in studio that day, just buy the digital CD of your photos. You get to keep all of them instead of having to pick your favorite three or four. Oh, and again, it is way cheaper to take that CD to a photo kiosk and have them printed yourself. Please don't spend $400 on a couple of photos that you can't legally copy when you could have gotten an $80 CD of all the photos and the copyright. Story 16. Software developer. A lot of big companies are barely keeping up with tech. Innovation for them is like saying, let's upgrade our core systems from Windows XP to Vista in 2020. As a consultant, I simply don't trust big companies anymore with my identity or money. The state that their on-premises hardware and software are in is an apocalypse waiting to happen. There may be a few teams that actually do use the latest stable tech, but they usually integrate on top of the other crap and get bottlenecked. More often than not, the solution would be to try to get the very last bit, pun intended, out of a system rather than to migrate it. I think in most cases it will be 5 to 10 years at minimum by the time we've reached the bottom of that barrel, and actually start addressing the problem. Have any of you guys used Vista before? I had a laptop I used to game on that had Vista on it, and I used it for like 4 years. It was hanging on by the end. It was trying its hardest. It also didn't help that I, yes, I went on those videos that's like, ooh, free Robux, look at that. It's never free Robux. Don't believe them, guys. Story 17. I'm a massage therapist, and the biggest secret is stretching. If you stretch properly, you will get rid of effectively 90% of the problems, but no one is taught how to stretch properly. The best stretches are actually the stretches you learn in middle school. Hold still, count to 10, take deep, deep breaths, move on. I'm not gonna lie, this post has blown up a lot more than I expected. And I'm just going to give a little more information. The whole point of stretching is to do the opposite motion of what the muscle does whenever it's in use. And the point of stretching is also to alleviate pain and bring circulation to the area and regulate the muscle's basic systems. So here's the basic rule. If you hurt somewhere, do not stretch that place. Find the opposite muscle in the opposite movement and stretch that one. The way the body works is kind of like a giant game of tug-of-war. 
Muscle actually controls the movement of bone and helps with your posture. No one has perfect posture, though. So stretching makes sure that nobody wins the tug of war and that your bones remain in place as close to perfect as possible, which means that your bones and ligaments don't take any damage from gravity or any other force that affects your body during your daily life. I will not lie, however, if you do have injuries, like if you have broken or torn or dislocated or separated something, that pain will never go away. It will dissipate and it will get to a lower level in which your body will be able to tolerate it on a daily basis, but it will never go away. The body can never correct something that's been broken. This should help you be able to search your own stretches online, but apparently I need to make a YouTube channel. Just think opposites. If your back hurts, look for stretches for your front, like in your chest and in your core. If the front of your legs hurts, you need to stretch the back of your legs. If the front of your arms hurt, stretch the back of your arms. Just do the complete opposite of wherever you hurt, and start stretching that area and you should notice pretty quickly that it's tighter when you stretch the side that does not hurt than versus when you stretch the side that does. Good luck. Story 18. I work as an accessibility consultant. There's a misconception that building accessibility is a cost without a return. If I build a ramp, it'll cost money. If I make an automatic door, it'll cost money. But studies and real-life situations have shown that the return is much greater than the cost. If you make your office more accessible, you are able to hire people with disabilities, who actually have lower absentee and turnover rates, saving you money in training and lost time. If your business is accessible, the person is more likely to not only return, but also tell others about your store being accessible. And if you, a customer or an employee, happen to suffer a disabling condition, that person can return to your business afterwards. It's a secret that's not really a secret, but people seem to act like it is. Almost every client I've had who has ended up implementing accessibility improvements end up loving it afterwards, and attracted entirely new customers too, such as seniors. Why is it that people who run businesses seem to make these oversights all the time? Like, isn't this specifically what you specialize in, is like how to make money? And yet you don't realize the long-term benefits of something like making your building more accessible? I don't get it, man. Story 19. I work in the blood industry, for medical slash research slash manufacture use. When you donate, your red blood cells and most platelets will actually be used for medical purposes. But about 85% of the plasma donated will be sold to makeup companies and other manufacturers. Roughly 20% of platelets will also be sold to manufacturers. Your white blood cells will either be sold for research or discarded, since they're basically useless for medical or manufacture purposes. Overall, about 50% of your blood will be used for treatments. And the rest will go to makeup or manufacturing and research companies. I'm not saying don't donate, it still helps people, but it's just something nobody really thinks about when you have that needle in your arm. Story 20. Starbucks slash Subway slash Chipotle slash Taco Bell slash probably every other fast food slash casual food service all have very high standards of uniformity. Every drink slash food should always look and taste exactly the same anywhere the customer goes or else. That's the bad news. The good news is that most of us don't care what corporate says, and do care that, nah uh 16 olive slices or 9 caramel ribbons does not count as extra, and we happily are hooking you up with way more than we are allowed to scoop or pour or serve, just by instinct, just out of spite that we can't pay our whole rent. We almost all agree, screw the system, here's an extra McNugget. If you ever receive food or drink that has way less of the good stuff than you expected, it's most likely not because you've been slighted by lazy employees and way more likely that you were served by an excellent employee who always follows company standards and measures out exactly what they are supposed to. Calling to complain does very little. You're probably tattling on someone who never breaks rules and is a total butt-kissing narc. Pointing at another employee and shouting, but he did it for me last time is a narc move, stop it. Enjoy an endless future of secret decaf espresso and light nacho cheese.